Hello everybody and welcome to a new show I have here on the channel. As of right now it is only on YouTube, but I do eventually hope to make this available on any podcast feeds. But as of right now it is only available on on YouTube. It is a wrestling podcast with Mr. Eli Mack. I am your host, Mr. Eli Mack, and if you are listening to this on the YouTubes, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, and also hit the notification bell. That way you can be notified whenever a new wrestling podcast video comes your way. Also, if you hit the no- if you hit the subscribe button, that really helps me so much. We got to 60 subscribers, so let's go for the next goal, which is 70 subscribers. So, yes, this is the new show that I've always wanted to do, a wrestling podcast. Talk about everything to do with wrestling, because I love wrestling so much. I love it, I love it, I love it, and I want to talk about it. And so that is what this little thing is going to be about. So, before we actually get into the main topic, which will be talking about Crown Jewel 2022, it is in the books, it is the big Saudi Arabia show that the WWE puts on for the company, and with the big main event of Roman Reigns versus Logan Paul, that was the big main event, but before we even get into any of that, let's look up what is the news for the wrestling world. Recently on Instagram, there has been a lot of controversy with Nick Aldis, who was one of the mainstays of the NWA throughout its entire time of trying to regain some sort of relevancy. And the big reason why there's a lot of controversy right now is because on Instagram this past weekend, he accidentally, in quotes, I I am, I'm adding the quotes, posted a video that was basically him saying that he wants to resign from the company and basically wanting to leave, but then after that video went up live, he quickly took that down and he has stated that that video was meant for his subscribers alone, which again, this is a very awkward situation since he's meant to be competing in a NWA World Championship match soon. I believe I want to say that is happening at NWA 74, which is close, I want to say. I think it's close. I'm not 100% sure. But with that being said, like, after that video came out, he's actually being reported to have been replaced with Tyrus. And so this is a very interesting situation that is coming out. I'm not the biggest follower of NWA. I want to try with this podcast to do more stuff with looking at every single type of wrestling, NWA, GCW, trying to do more of the indie stuff and try to get myself more familiar with that stuff. But I do remember Nick Aldis being like one of the big players of the NWA. Again, sort of being the person that kept NWA relevant for a very long time, especially having a match with Cody Rhodes for the NWA championship pre-AEW at All In. Yeah, at All In. I almost called it All Out. But yeah, Nick Aldis was very much the top star at NWA, and sort of seeing the fallout between himself and Billy Corgan, that's really not going to be great to see. And it's also just sad to see, because again, Nick Aldis is a major star, and I do think he has a big future, and I be- his contract, I believe, is about to be up. Again, I'm not 100% sure on that. I'm just a regular fan talking about all this stuff. And so I'm very much curious when his contract does go up, if he goes to AEW or WWE, based off of the few clips I've seen of him throughout his career with NWA, I think he would be a very great fit for WWE because he is someone that likes to wear nice suits and carry the title around in his hand, not around his waist, sort of like Triple H back in the day. So I think he would be a good fit for WWE if he decides to go in that direction. In other WWE trying to bring back stars, it was recently reported by Fightful Select You should go subscribe to their newsletter. It's very great. Great $5, honestly. It is being reported that Chelsea Green is being looked at of bringing her back to the WWE after she was released in late 2020. Recently, she's been going the indie circuit. Well, I say indie circuit in quotes because it's NWA, Impact, and Ring of Honor, all major promotions. 
And she still has a lot of indie bookings to fulfill all the way to March 2023. So we'll see if WWE brings her back. Again, she's also on a list along with Tegan Knox to for WWE wanting to bring back. It's sort of showing that WWE wants to have more depth to their women's roster. And even like with this, it could later lead to potentially having the women's tag division a little bit beefier than what it's currently at right now. Because right now, I can only name you like three of their big tag teams right now that are actively wrestling outside of Sasha and Naomi with um, Damage Control being the current women's tag team champions, Shotzi and Raquel being another team, and then another major team being Asuka and Alexa Bliss. So I'm very much curious if by the time 2023 comes around, if Chelsea Green would be willing to go back because her and her husband Matt Cardona were both released around the same time and Matt Cardona very much able to make a name for himself outside of WWE with GCW and Impact and Ring of Honor and AEW. Again, he's been he had a great like right out of the gate, right out of WWE, almost a WCW, but right out of the WWE, Matt Cardona was able to make a major name for himself. Chelsea Green again continuing to make a great name for herself. So we'll see if Chelsea Green ever does truly decide to go back to WWE. And who knows if Tegan Knox would also want to go back as well. But then the final piece of news that I want to talk about is Braun Strowman putting his foot in his mouth. Because recently, this past weekend after the Saudi show, he tweeted about talking about how great um, the big men were. And I'm going to try to find the tweet. That way I can properly quote it. Well, it's quite funny as I try to look for the uh, tweet to properly quote it. But I look on Twitter and it's not there anymore. So very much I think all the heat that Adam Shear, a.k.a. Braun Strowman, was getting from some of his co-workers and other wrestlers outside of the business who are known for doing a lot of flippy stuff or like a lot of high-flying moves taking a lot of umbrage to what um, Braun Strowman had to say with him basically saying that he and Amos got 47 five-star matches and saying that being big men are better than being people that do flippy stuff. Again, doing the high-flying stuff that I'm actually a really big fan of. Again, I grew up watching Rey Mysterio and him being the high-flyer that he is. So I am someone that grew up with seeing a lot of high-flying, flippy moves. So I very much gravitate towards that type of wrestling. So whenever I see someone like um, Braun Strowman, a big guy, type of wrestling that I wasn't a big fan of, I start seeing him insulting the um, the high flying stuff. It's very annoying to me. So it's sort of it's sort of interesting to see that a lot of people called him out on it, and him very much going back on the back foot for it. So we'll see what happens with him in the future. If Triple H is gonna take all that and say, "Hey, Braun, Mustafa Ali, who Mustafa Ali was one of the main people that shot back at him." basically replying to it with, can you teach me how to get fired? Which was very much a shot at Braun being fired from the WWE, while also maybe being a hidden message of being like, hey, I don't want to be working in WWE anymore, which was from early in the year, which I believe he's doing a whole lot better in this regime with Triple H being in the United States title scene. But yeah, we'll see if Triple H is going to look at that and be like, hey, why don't I just put you two in a match against each other and just you two can duke it out. But I don't think Triple H would do something like that. He's someone not like Tony Khan who wants to take the animosity between two real people like the real animosity between two people and have them settle it in the ring triple h is someone that i feel like doesn't want to do that he wants to do what's best for business and i think having two people that legitimately do not like each other have them wrestle each other in the ring to make good business i don't think that is what's best for business and i think triple h understands that so i don't think we're going to be seeing a mustafa ali versus braun Strowman match but who knows, anything is possible. But those were some of the big talking points. I know I probably missed quite a few, but oh yeah, a major one that I missed. I can't believe coming out of Crown Jewel, Logan Paul was injured. He revealed that he tore his meniscus 
MCL and ACL. I believe those were the specific ones. And during his match, he said it happened halfway through the main event match at Crown Jewel. So a speedy recovery to Logan Paul. So because, again, he's a great competitor in the ring, whether I like it or not. So I really hope that he is able to recover because I have my own fantasy booking idea for what I want him to do at WrestleMania. Who knows if he'll be able to be um, up and going at WrestleMania or even by the Royal Rumble. We'll find out in the coming in the coming weeks to see if he is actually able to work that. But until then, we here at a wrestling podcast with Mr. Eli Mack, which is just me, Mr. Eli Mack, hope him a speedy recovery. That way he can get back into the ring as soon as possible. But with that being said, let's actually get into Crown Jewel, which was a very fun event, very much overall. Where is my mouse? There it is. I need to double check the results. That way I can get an idea. But it was a very fun event. It was a lot of fun. I think it was probably, I think it was my first Crown Jewel or actually Saudi event that I actually sat down and watched from beginning to end. And it was actually a lot of fun. So let's get into the first match, which was Bobby Lashley versus Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar getting the victory in six minutes exactly by pinfall, but it was not as one-sided as Brock Lesnar matches usually are. In fact, it's very much more of just Brock Lesnar is in control, but very early on, Bobby Lashley was able to pick up the steam and very much take the momentum, but then Brock Lesnar was able to get back into it again finishers, finishers, finishers was very much the point of the match, but then Bobby Lashley was able to put on the Hurt Lock, and Brock Lesnar reversed that into a pinning combination to get the win, and I have to say, like, I was very intrigued to see Bobby Lashley be the dominator, for lack of a better term, in this match, and sure, Brock Lesnar was able to get the win, but even after the match, Bobby Lashley went on a tear to basically beat down Brock Lesnar, so this could potentially lead to another match, whether that be at Survivor Series or the Royal Rumble, or if this could encourage Brock Lesnar to enter the Royal Rumble match with Bobby Lashley also in it, and, you know, have them go at it and basically eliminating both, both of, eliminating each other to set up a match at WrestleMania for, like, hopefully a longer time than six minutes, who knows, but, yeah, this was a very fun match, and I like to see Bobby Lashley able to get a lot of his heat back and sort of prove that he can still be the stronger competitor of the two. Moving on, we had Alexa Bliss and Asuka, the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, defending their titles against Damage Control, the team of Dakota Kai and Io Sky, and Damage Control was able to pick up the victory at after tw- after 12 minutes and 50 seconds. Yeah, they were able to pick up the victory. Again, very shocking that they changed the titles. Again, it's one of those interesting things of they had Alexa and Asuka win at Raw, and then they just changed the titles again at Crown Jewel. I'm fine with the title just swapping back and forth between these two teams because these two teams have great chemistry together. Asuka and Io Sky, I'm waiting for them to just have a one-on-one match and it will be a strong match very much. But also before the match, we got a tease of Alexa potentially joining Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt Six. Who knows? The only way we'll know is when we get a little bit closer to the Wyatt Six potentially being revealed to determine what the Wyatt Six actually even is. Is it a faction? Is it six split personalities? Separate personalities for Bray Wyatt? Who knows? But all I know is that I'm very much looking forward to seeing the future of what's going to happen with Damage Control and Asuka and Alexa. Moving on, we have our next match, which was... Drew McIntyre versus Karrion Cross in a steel cage match. This match went 13 minutes. Again, a lot of these matches ended in very much whole numbers. There's only one that didn't end in a whole number, but it ended with Drew McIntyre escaping over the cage, not through the door, which was very much Scarlett's main thing of keeping the door closed and locking it near the finish of this match. And locking the door, and Drew McIntyre was like, all right, I'll just go over it. And her making a mad dash to try to open the door. And she used Mace 
or patent it mace to to blind the referee and Drew McIntyre, which I think Drew might have been like, ah, I have it scouted, so you didn't get mine, all of it. You didn't get all of my eyes. You only got a bit of it, but it was enough for me to get out of the get out of the ring. I could not do a Scottish accent. But yeah, this sort of ends this portion of the Drew carrying cross storyline. They're now sort of at one apiece one apiece when it comes to the big pay-per-view. So I'm curious to see if Drew and Karrion have another match at Survivor Series. I have an idea of what they should do at Survivor Series, but again, it's one of those fantasy booking things for me where if they really are interested in having a final blow-off for Karrion and Drew... The way I have it in my head is completely different from what I think they would do it. They would probably have at Survivor Series just a one-on-one match and some crazy stipulation. But in my head, like, I have a different idea. And I'm going to release a video of, like, a fantasy booking of one major event or major storyline that I would like to see. But that in that entire thing, Drew and Karrion would play somewhat of a minor feature in that story. But anyway, we move on to the next match, which was the OC, AJ Styles, Luke Gallows, and Carl Anderson versus the Judgment Day, Finn Balor, Damian Priest, and Dominic Mysterio with Rhea Ripley in the corner. And this match went 14 minutes with Judgment Day picking up the win. Again, AJ Styles and the entire story with this match was Rhea Ripley is the difference maker. We need to even up the odds, but they didn't even up the odds, and Rhea Ripley was able to distract AJ and hurt him and allowing Finn Balor to get the pin on AJ. So I'm very much, I very much like this match. I really did. I think a lot of them did their parts well, and I don't know. There's something about Dominic Mysterio that I'm like, you're playing your part well, but I know you can wrestle. You may not be the greatest wrestler, but I know you can wrestle. So can we get you to wrestle a little bit more? Because I would love for you to wrestle a little bit more and to show your chops. And they're also very much pushing the story of Ray and Dominic, or Ray doesn't want to fight Dominic, and so Dominic is continuing his own path. I do hope they eventually get a Ray versus Dominic match, maybe at WrestleMania. I wouldn't mind it being at WrestleMania. But yeah, um, the OC, again, losing very much. If they, I don't know how they're going to push another match out of this feud because the Judgment Day have very much been dominating the OC for a majority of this feud. So I don't know how you push another match into this unless the OC are just like, hey, we finally have our difference maker, our even outer, for Rhea, so now we want a four-on-four match, a mixed-gender four-on-four match, and so maybe that's how they could do it. Again, I don't know how they'll need to do a lot of leaping through logic, but this is wrestling. You can find logic out of everything, but also another thing to note, it was very nice to hear Michael Cole mention by name the Bullet Club and mention that Carl Anderson was the never-open-rate champion for New Japan Pro Wrestling. It's just, it's Triple H very much wanting to, I think that's that's Triple H way of showing the crowd that, hey, WWE is not the only wrestling promotion in the world. I know that, everyone else knows that, and it was something that, I think is very much something that Triple H wants to be able to show that there are more wrestling promotions out there in the world. We're not the only one Unlike Vince, who were, who was very much, no, WWE is the only thing that exists. Nothing exists outside of my little universe. And I really hope that, I know this isn't going to be a way to do it, because, again, in January, where they're going to have Shinsuke Nakamura versus The Great Muda, which I already can tell you right now, that's going to be a great match. But I think that this could potentially be a way for... WWE to start accepting like, hey, maybe we can have partnerships with some of these other wrestling promotions. Maybe we can find ways to have crossovers and such. I don't know. I would love to see Triple H potentially give that an idea and potentially throw that out to the ether because I would very much, I think a lot of people would love to see, I think a lot of people would love to see potentially Seth Rollins versus someone like Will Ospreay or Zack Sabre Jr. or someone like that and potentially get 
matches that we would never thought we would see under the Vince McMahon regime. That's just my opinion. The next match on the card was Amos versus Braun Strowman. The match went 7 minutes and 20 seconds. Braun Strowman won, and it was very one-sided throughout the match. Like, Amos had a majority of the offense. He looked like a monster. Braun Strowman was very much selling the fact that Braun, that Amos was a dominant big man, a dominant giant. And it wasn't until Amos had one slip up that Braun Strowman was able to pick up the victory after a running power slam. Again, we I talked about what happened with Braun earlier and how the how he how he got 47 five stars against all the people who do flips. And sure, this match delivered what it needed to do to make Amos look like a big star. Again, this isn't making this isn't taking away anything from Amos. This actually made him pretty prominent star and I think what Amos can do in the future could be great things. I really want more matches with Amos and Braun Strowman, add a little bit more destruction, and I think that could be a lot of fun. I legitimately do think they could have a lot of fun. The next match was the Brawling Brutes, the team of Rich Holland and Butch, versus the undisputed WWE Tag Team Champions, the Usos, for the titles. Early on in the match, it was mentioned that Jay Uso has a broken wrist. I think it was his right hand. It was taped up. And I'm hoping... I'm hoping, and they said they were going to get an MRI on it. I'm hoping it's not a bad break, like where he's going to be out for months and months and months, or it's just um, kayfabe, because I would really love it if it was kayfabe. That way he could continue wrestling, because later on in the main event for the title, for the Undisputed WWE Universal Championship, he came out without it taped up, so maybe it's not a horrible, maybe it doesn't give him a lot of pain, maybe he can continue to wrestle without it um, getting messed up a bit more. Who knows? I'm just hoping that he's not horribly injured and we can see Jay Uso continue to wrestle because I have plans for him in my fantasy booking video for um, that I'm going to release later on in the week. But yeah, this was a very fun bout. Uso's pick up Picked up the win at 10 minutes and 45 seconds. Again, there's that non-hole number. And they were able to pick up the win after a corner top rope 1D, which was so much fun to see on Ridge Holland. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing, because I'm assuming that the Brawling Brutes with Sheamus versus the Bloodline is going to be the big feud continuing out the rest of the year and even going all the way to Royal Rumble to see Sheamus challenge Roman for the titles. I legitimately think that's going to be the title match at the Royal Rumble. I could see the Usos and the Brawling Brutes or at least the Bloodline and the Brawling Brutes with maybe some additional people could be the War Games match at Survivor Series. They announced that War Games is going to be five on five. So when I initially was doing the math in my head, I was like, oh yeah, you can take four members of Bloodline that's not Roman versus th the three Brawling Brutes plus one. Yeah, it'd be great. But now that it's five on five, reorient it. That's sort of where I said Karrion and Drew can come in, have Karrion join the Bloodline for just one match only and have Drew join Brawling Brutes for this match. And I think that could be a fun event. I don't know. That's just an idea that I have. So yeah. Again, this was a fun tag team championship match, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with the future for this um, feud. And then after that, we had the last woman standing match for the WWE Raw, Raw Women's Championship. Bianca Belair versus Bayley. There were a lot of fun spots in this match. A lot of fun spots. There was a golf cart. There was um, there was Bayley standing on, uh, uh, I think I want to say an equipment box. Or not standing on it, she just put... She just put Bianca in an equipment box. Um, ladders, chairs, oh my. So much stuff happened in this match. Ultimately, Bianca picked up the win. I don't know. Honestly, like, I might have predicted Bianca was going to win, but I don't know if that was the right move. Honestly, if you're going to have damage control be the tag team champions, women's tag team champions, and you're not going to give Bailey anything, I think having Bianca was the wrong move, honestly. Because at this point, and I hate to say this because I'm a big fan of Bianca. Again, she's from Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm from Tennessee, so she's sort of a hometown girl. I'm not from Knoxville, but whatever. 
But I think if you keep putting her in this trajectory, she could slowly get into the Charlotte Flair or even the John Cena mode of, oh, she's always winning. She's not losing. We don't like that. And then people start to boo her. That's something I think they need to be aware of. Again, there are a lot of Bianca Bailey, Bianca Belair fans, but there are a lot more Bailey fans, honestly. I think Bailey deserved to pick up the win in this match. And... But, like, again, I'm not going to complain about Bianca getting the win. She's a great wrestler. She's done a lot for WWE recently. I think she might be one of the top merch sellers. I don't know. But, yeah, this match ended at 20 minutes and 20 seconds. Bianca winning by putting Bailey in a ladder and keeping it shut. So, yeah, I, I'm i very, again, I, I would rather have seen Bailey one, pick up the women Raw women's title and have damage control go on a run for a bit. But again, we don't know what this leads to war games because I'm assuming Damage Control and Bianca, Asuka, and Alexa are going to be the three of the five people involved in the women's war game match. Who knows? But then we get to our main event, Logan Paul versus Roman Reigns for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. The match was 24 minutes and 50 seconds. Roman Reigns defended the belt against Logan and he retained... There was a lot of crazy stuff in this match. Again, Logan Paul, whether I like him or hate him, deserves to get praised for all the in-ring work that he does because he looks like he legitimately cares about putting on a good product. He does legitimately have great athletic ability, and he's proven that he can hold his own against Roman. I mean, should the match have been as long as it was? Maybe not. Should Roman have just executed Logan Paul in the match? Who knows? There are some people that would say yes. There are some people that say no. Overall, when I'm looking at the story for this match, they were saying it was basically Logan telling Roman, hey, don't count me out. You're looking down at me. Like, don't think I can't hold my own against you. And I believe the story going into that, and like even in the match, was Roman was taking taking Logan Paul lightly. And sort of that's the reason why Logan was able to get the upper hand for a grand majority of this match. And very much there was one spot that I liked, which was he took his his friend's phone and basically vlogged the frog splash to the announce table. They actually released the video from that phone. And so when I was watching it from that perspective, I was like, that's really cool. I think that's pretty cool to see because they they also slowed it down a bit during the fall so my brain legitimately thought for a second that wow did the fall actually happen that slow I thought it was a lot faster but yeah it was a lot of fun this match was a lot of fun it went crazy near the end Jake Paul came out to take down the Usos when because after that frog splash spot the Usos came down check on Roman and the Usos attacked some of their some of the Logan Paul entourage and then Jake Paul came out and knocked out um, the Usos, and then Solo Sokoa came out to take on Jake Paul. That didn't happen, but then Logan Paul took out the Usos with a plancha, I want to, I think it was a plancha, over the top ring rope from the ring to the outside, but then when Logan got back in the ring, there was a Superman punch and then a spear for Roman to retain the title. Ultimately, and I think everyone knew Logan wasn't going to win. Again, should the match have gone as long as it did? It went 24 minutes. Should it have gone that long? Maybe, maybe not. I think it all depends on if you care about how the match went in the ring or how the story was told. Again, I was fine with the story that they were telling. I think the, again, I love the match chemistry. They had a really good chemistry in the ring. I very much loved all the near falls. There were a lot of legitimate moments where, even though in my head I knew Roman was going to win, there were a lot of moments where I thought, wait, are they going to legit do it right now? Because, like, those those near falls were pretty tight. And, yeah, I think this match served what it needed to do. It made Logan look pretty strong. And I think the next challenger for Roman, I don't think we're getting a rematch because, again, Logan's injured, so we're not getting a rematch. But I legitimately think that Sheamus is going to be the next competitor. If Jay is fine, if Jay gets the MRI and they say, hey, it's not that bad of a break, you're not going to be out for that long. So, like, if he's able to be in the 
if he's able to be in war games, I think it's going to be the Bloodline minus Roman with Karrion Cross, and it's going to be them. And when I say the Bloodline, I mean the Usos, Solo Sokoa, and Sammy with Karrion Cross, and it's going to be they're going to go up against the Brawling Brutes with Sheamus, Butch, and Rich Holland, and Drew McIntyre is also going to be in that match. And who's going to be the fifth one? I think they're going to do a surprise and a swerve, and they're going to have Kevin Owens pop into the match as well to sort of throw off Sammy and like that's my if I were to do it that's sort of what I would do I think that would be the five but ultimately I would have the bloodline pick up the victory but somehow continue to push Sheamus versus Sheamus versus um, Roman for the Royal Rumble because I think that's legitimately going to be the title match at the Royal Rumble and I think that it would be a very great match to have. Because, again, Sheamus is on, like, the run of his career right now. And I would love to see Sheamus versus Roman Reigns. Because a majority of the time when they were going up against each other early on, Sheamus was always the heel and Roman was the face. And now the dynamics have really shifted. So I would love to see Sheamus as face right now go up against Roman and just have a banger after banger after banger after banger. And I know I've currently left out Logan Paul, but I'm hoping that he gets healed up enough to be at um, WrestleMania. Because personally, though I didn't think Jake Paul had a lot of great work punches, I think it would be great to see Jake Paul versus Logan Paul at the Royal Rumble. Why? Because why not? Like, just have the Paul brothers go up against each other. Logan would be in his fourth match, and it could potentially be a fun match. And that that's just my opinion. That's what I would see for the WrestleMania match for Logan Paul. But besides all that, there's really nothing else to talk about in terms of Crown Jewel, except, I almost forgot, Bray Wyatt had a promo. And it was right before the main event. And he was basically talking about how he doesn't want to go to the darkness, how he wants to be himself. But then Uncle Howdy came back on and was basically like, hey, you should let the anger in. You should be your darker self. Let the darkness and all that stuff. So I'm curious to see where this is going to lead. Like The Bray Wyatt stuff is very interesting. And I didn't do it justice. If you really want to see it being done justice, you have to go watch the actual promo yourself. But overall, I'm very interested in seeing where the Bray Wyatt storyline goes. I don't even know how to like fantasy book that storyline because I have no idea where it could go. All I can say is I'm going to be watching it with bated breath and seeing what Bray Wyatt does with his characters, of with his personal character, with what Alexa might do in the future, and with what Uncle Howdy could be in the future and what Uncle Howdy could be manifesting. But yeah, that was Crown Jewel and that was that. And we're going to have a Raw coming out tonight. I'm hoping to release this on the Monday. And I probably am Raw Preview. Yeah, I'm definitely typing this out as I'm still recording. So what is the Raw Preview for tonight and based off of what I'm looking at right now there is no card but it is showing Brock Lesnar right now but I am not seeing anything else I just know it's going to be the fallout for the Saudi Arabia show maybe we start seeing hints of what they're going to be doing for the war games matches and like start hinting at what may be happening oh wait I'm I found a website so yeah not much is announced we know again there's going to be crown jewel fallout will and it will include damage control um yeah so there's not much left there's not much else that i can say about what's going to be happening all i know is that stuff is going to happen stuff is going to happen at raw then we'll start sending up survivor series war games but yeah that has been everything right now there was a lot of rambling near the end but that's okay this is the first episode of a wrestling podcast with mr eli mag if you like this podcast please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel we got to 60 now let's try to get the 70 subscribers i would love to get to that point also hit the notification bell that way you can be notified whenever another wrestling podcast episode comes your way until next time i've been mr eli mag you've been the audience and i hope you all have a great rest of the day